I'm going to be staying behind here this morning. The fan is blowing on me. So if you have your Bible, let's go ahead and begin in Luke chapter 16. We have a lot of ground to cover in a short amount of time to do it. Luke chapter 16 is probably the rich man in Lazarus is probably one of the most well-known teachings uh, of Jesus, especially in Luke's gospel. And <clears throat> honestly, a lot of debate has been had through the years on is this an actual account or is, the, that is, is it a historical account of something that happened that Jesus is telling or is it a parable? We're not going to entertain that thought because at the end of the day, it's a discussion worthy of having, but it's not a discussion that really changes anything. What it teaches is still what it teaches, okay? Whether it's a parable or it's a literal account, the message of it remains the same. And so I think sometimes we end up getting caught up and... I wonder sometimes if the devil doesn't smile at us as we're sitting here arguing about, is it an account or is it a parable? And the whole time, he, he's okay with us having that discussion as long as we won't listen to the message of it and live by it. And so <clears throat> we're going to sidestep that discussion this morning, and we're going to look at this particular text. Now, if you're like me, when you look at, <clears throat> and for years, if you're familiar with it, when you have looked at the rich man, you rightly look and you are frustrated, you're angry at what you see for how he treats <clears throat> Lazarus on this occasion and uh, his general hardness of heart. But sometimes we need to ask ourselves some really hard questions. And, and sometimes the question we need to ask ourselves is this. It's the one we're going to ask ourselves this morning is, are you the rich man? Are you the rich man? Somebody says, there's no way I could be the rich man because, well, I'm not rich. Well, rich is a relative term to begin with. Its definition is extremely difficult to ascertain. Um, for an example, we use, if someone were to ask, if someone were to ask me, are you, you like to play golf? Yes. Are you any good? That depends, Right? Good is relative. What do you mean, good compared to my three-year-old? Good compared to other people who have played as long as I have? Or good compared to a professional? You see, it, it's relative. It, it has fluidity to it. And so the same thing, it's, it's interesting in class settings sometimes I will ask this simple question. What does it mean to be rich? Who is rich? And it will, this, this truth will manifest itself. People will say all different things about their understanding of who a rich person is. Because they always measure it as the standard of someone who is just a step above them. <clears throat> but the truth of the matter is, as Americans, we're rich. If you look at the average income in the rest of the world, we're not just rich, we're wealthy. Even the poorest among us are wealthy. And so what is being communicated in this text is <clears throat> more about, are we willing to you and, and Luke's gospel has this emphasis, are we willing to use the things that God has given to us, or are we willing to simply hoard them and waste them? So as we think about this text, I want us to do two things. First, I just want us to analyze the text, to kind of get behind the text and see the world and, and, and try and feel the weight of it the way they would have understood it and heard it when Jesus gave it. And then make uh, three applications. Or there are three characteristics of the rich man that we need to uh, think through about ourselves. So we're going to move very swiftly as we begin to analyze the text. But basically, this text is a common Greek method of teaching where you will have two extremes in a story because it helps to illustrate a point. It puts one against the other like a juxtaposition, and one of them pops out very strongly. Okay, So, first we're introduced to two men and their existences upon earth. It says, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen. Purple is, uh, obviously, it was <clears throat> dyed, they were dyed garments. Um, it took about a thousand of these sea snails and mollusks to produce a, a gram of dye, of this purple dye. You remember Lydia is a seller of purple. And it may be that purple, depending on what Acts 16 and some things said in Philippians, it may be that the, the purple trade um, was something that belonged to the imperial family in Rome. 
But it's truly and highly expensive, okay? That's the point. He's wearing a very beautiful... Purple is reserved many times for royalty and for kings and for people who are representatives of God and things along those lines. So he's clothed in purple and fine linen, Egyptian or Indian in its nature, white with a red-brown uh, tint to it. And so here you have a man, basically the, the premise is he's very nicely dressed. He's not criticized for that, by the way. There's nothing wrong with him. Luke is, Jesus is not giving the story. Luke is not writing it to say, hey, you can't wear nice things. That's not the point. And then it says, he feasted sumptuously every day. Now this word translated feasted is also used in chapter 12 and verse uh, 19, where you have the parable of the rich fool, when he says to himself, take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. The term translated merry is the term, same term translated here, sumptuously. So he is living a very cushy lifestyle. And it's not just something where, you know, we can do this occasionally. We can have, we may have nice clothes, but, you know, they're, some of those things are reserved for certain occasions. Or we may go eat a really nice meal, but those are special and different occasions. This is his everyday existence. Okay? Number two, then we see Lazarus. <clears throat> And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus. His gate, the exterior to his compound, he was laid. The word here, <clears throat> it's, this, it's the same word from which we get the English word to throw. It means he's thrown at the gate. Um, trying to figure out exactly what is being done here with this word picture is, is a little complicated. But I'm 70-30% I'm confident that the idea is because... In Luke's gospel, and when it's used, especially in the passive voice in the original, um, it, it describes people who are crippled or outcasts. Okay, And so the idea is not that you have people that are taking Lazarus and gently lying him in front of the gate, but he's just kind of a nuisance. We're going to take him, we'll dump him here at the rich man, and maybe he'll give him something to eat. Okay, The idea is that he is disregarded. And the fact that he is called poor... And there are two Greek terms for poor. One is just simply getting by. You, I mean, you can eke out a living. But the other is that you're wholly dependent on somebody else. That's the word used here. He has no ability. Okay? He, he, he cannot provide for himself. He's sick. Okay? So he's laid at the rich man's gate, and he's covered with sores. The image in my mind, it, it takes you back to someone like Job who was covered in sores. King James says boils. The idea, though, in the Septuagint, the translation of the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, it's the same word used in Job's account that's used here. Okay, So he's covered in these sores and boils. And he desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. That is, he can see the feasting. He can see them faring sumptuously, and he's not asking for anything on the table. He's just asking for what falls off. What the dogs would eat, what the Canaanite woman said in Matthew 15 and verse 27. Then it says, moreover, <clears throat> even the dogs came and licked his sores. Notice that phrase, even. Even the dogs came. For an example, in Philippians chapter 2, when it describes the death of Jesus, it says he became obedient unto the point of death, even the death on a cross. Because the death on the cross, that even is, is symbolizing and, and emphasizing that the cross was the most um, egregious type of death a person could die. And so when it's saying here, more, even the dogs came and licked his sores. Dogs, in this particular context, the idea seems to be when you see the word dog, an American, you should probably think of something like an opossum. It's not a furry pet. It's a scavenger. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 7 and verse 6, don't cast your pearls before swine. All right? And don't give what is holy to dogs. And so it's not like this cute, vaccinated, home, fluffy, manufactured well-bred dog that's coming and licking his sores that his parents or his owners brush his teeth every day. And so their existences 
could not be more different. Okay? There is no way their existences could be more different as we watch them, as we watch the story unfold. But then we see <clears throat> their exits. It says, The poor man died and was carried by angels to Abraham's side. He, was, he died. Not told how, not told why. doesn't matter. It's not relevant to the story. But he dies, and he would have been taken and buried in a field for strangers. You remember Matthew 27 and verse 7, when Jesus was crucified, they took the money that they paid off Jesus to do what with? They said, we can't put it back in the treasury, so we're going to buy a field to bury strangers in. Even to this day, yearly, in many cities throughout this world, they will have a place of reading the names of unclaimed bodies that have shown up in the morgues of local cities. So here he is. When he died, he was discarded. His body was discarded. But his soul was not. And the angels who are ministers to those who inherit salvation, Hebrews 1 and verse 14, they brought him to Abraham's side, or literally to his bosom. The idea of being gathered to his people, Genesis 15 and verse 15. The idea of being in the embrace of Abraham. It says the rich man also died and was buried. And the idea behind buried is he had a full, elaborate funeral. But their eternities were as different as their existences. Because Lazarus meets Abraham... Verse 23, in Hades... Hades is just the idea of the land of the dead. It's where all dead people go. It's an, an adoption of the term. Um, of course, they spoke Greek, and this is the language of the New Testament. Their understanding of where the dead went was the Hadean realm. Okay, And that's not... <clears throat> the Hadean realm has a good side and a bad side. All right, uh, Tartarus and um, then paradise. And so in, in this understanding, this is the idea that's being painted here. It says, in Hades, being in torment, the term here is plural, the old King James actually renders it that way correctly, being in torments, he's tormented, he's in anguish on many different levels. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus at his side or in his bosom. Okay, the, the Jews of this particular time period believed, and when you look at, there's a writing called Second Ezra. Um, it's apocryphal, it's not inspired. But it is a writing that kind of, it has value because it tells you what they believed at that time, right? The same way we read documents from people all over the world to learn how they understood things at that time. And so they believed that the people on the torment side of the Hadean realm could see the people on the paradise side of the Hadean realm. And that increased the anguish. Okay, that's Second Ezra, or 4th Ezra 7, Verses uh, 85, and 85 to 93, I think. Um, so, I know you all have 4th Ezra at home. So, <laughs> uh, but if you want to Google it, it, it comes up pretty quickly. Um, anyway, so they had this idea that, that that exists. And so, this is not a discussion of eschatology. We can look at this text later as a discussion of what happens when you die. That's not the main point of this text. Okay, So, <clears throat> he's in anguish. And he sees and he calls out to Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Okay, have pity. The root, this term mercy is the same term that, that provides the root for the term for almsgiving. Taking care of the poor. Okay, now he is on the other side. Lazarus is a beggar in, in his existence on earth. And now what is the rich man? Now he's the beggar. He's crying out like the blind man in Luke 17. Have mercy on me, son of David. And so he calls out to Abraham, Father Abraham, because he's a Jew. And he says, send Lazarus to dip the end of his a finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, child or son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, and Lazarus in, ma in like manner bad things. And now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And beside all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that you, though who would pass from here uh, to you, may not be able, and none can may cross from there to us. 
So first of all, he tells him what? Remember. You disregarded Lazarus in life. And you lived at ease. And now the roles are reversed. You cannot disregard someone like this. And expect it to be okay with God. And now your roles are reversed. And then he says, furthermore, there's a great chasm or a gulf that is fixed between us. That there's no crossing over one way or the other. Where we are, we are. And there's no changing it. So he says, okay, I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house where I have five brothers. So that he may go and warn them lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham says they have Moses and the prophets. They have the Old Testament. They have the scriptures. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. And as we pointed out even recently in a study, that's absolutely true. In John chapter 11, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And at the end of that chapter, what do the Jewish leaders plot to do? To kill Jesus. Someone literally rose from the dead. And their response was, well, we got to kill Jesus. He raised him. And then when you get to the next chapter, in chapter 12, verses 10 and 11, because so many people are hearing about Lazarus being raised from the dead, that they're believing in Jesus, they say, okay, now we got to kill Lazarus. People say, "I I I wish I could see some of the miracles talked about in the Bible. Listen. (laughs) Miracles... If you won't believe what is written, you wouldn't believe a miracle if you saw it. People say, that's not true. Yes, it is, because the Bible is filled with people who saw miracles and did not believe them. It's not a lack of evidence. It's a disposition on the inside to reject whatever is put in front of you. So, That is a slow or a quick skimming the surface overview of what's going on. But for time reasons, we can't just do a whole bunch. So let's get here to the main point of what's going on. What was it about the rich man? I think there are three things we need to see about the rich man in this context. Number one, the rich man was selfish the only thing he was concerned about was himself okay how many times do you think did he leave his house exit the gate Lazarus lying right here exit the gate and then come back and exit and come back and exit and come back and here is Lazarus and what is he doing exactly what the priest and Levite did in Luke chapter 10 Now, the law to which he knew, he knew what the law said. Deuteronomy 14, 28 and 29, Deuteronomy 15. There's a whole discussion about the treatment of the poor under the law. But he was so selfish, the only thing he could see were his own needs. Right? And you can even see... If we, want to get, if we want to meddle a little bit and, and get a little, maybe rub against the grain a little bit. You know, he might have been thinking, well, you know, I can't help everybody. Well, you know, if I help him, they're going to be lining up for help next. Does that sound familiar? He's dying. He's dying at his door. He doesn't care. That is a level of selfishness that is really hard to fathom. If you ever do any reading about um, Mother Teresa and, and what she did in Calcutta and places along those lines of caring for the dead, basically what she did was she ran a an organization, so to speak, where they would bring people to die. The most unwanted in society. 
in a society that still reflects a lot of the attitude that existed in the world of the New Testament. And so she was being interviewed one time and she was asked, why do you tell people to wait to the very end and then you bring this person in and, and you, you drag them in through the door and you get them barely in and you just set them on the ground in your lap and you hold them and give them a cup of water and they die in your arms. Why do you do that? She said, because they've never had anybody to love them. And they're human beings made in the image of God and they deserve to be treated with dignity as they die. You see how selfless one individual can be and how selfish another individual can be. Furthermore, his selfishness is also seen in this regard. And this is one of the things that, that, that we have to understand. People think that hell is going to change people. Hell's not going to change a single person. The rich man was selfish in his life, and when he was in torture, he was still selfish. What did he say? Oh, can you get Lazarus to get me some water and bring it to me and touch my tongue? He still sees people as objects to be used for his own gratification or for his own relief. Furthermore, aren't there other people in hell with him? Send Lazarus back from the dead and let him warn who? Oh, my family. Those are the ones that really matter. My family, I've got five brothers, I don't want them coming to this place. And I can, you can understand his sentiment. But his sentiment is still too small. He's selfish. Number two, he disregarded God's law. Blatantly disregarded it. He let a man die at his gate. And never once lifted a finger to help him. I don't think I need to explain that. I hope I don't need to explain why that's so frustrating and enraging. But we've talked about this many times before. We have to be careful of categorizing people because when we categorize people we dehumanize them and when we dehumanize them it it allows us to treat them as objects and then we feel justified for not actually engaging with and helping other human beings And he also knew, by the way, that his family disregarded the law. From the discussion with Abraham, every implication is they knew what the law said too. They just weren't doing it. They were just like him. But the third characteristic is the most tragic of them all. And that is that the rich man was lost. Now, some people may look at him and say, you know what, he earned it. Serves him right. That's, not, that's, that's missing the point. Because when, when Abraham mentions, when Abraham responds to him, remember he says, Father Abraham, send Lazarus. He responds with a term of extreme gentleness. When he says child, it's technon. It's not a normal, it's, it's a normal word that was used to describe speaking to your children in a familial, extremely vulnerable, caring way. So when Abraham looked at him in his torment, Abraham was not saying to him, you know what, it serves you right. It would seem that it hurt Abraham to say, you're my child, and I lost you. 
And it would seem also that when you look at what's going on here, that the rich man is shocked that he wakes up in hell. That's the thing. You go throughout Scripture and there are multiple instances where people are lost and they're shocked by it. Matthew 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. He who does the will of my Father in that heaven. And in that day, many will say to me, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons and do many wonderful works? And God says, Jesus says what? I never knew you. What about Matthew 25 of the judgment scene? Once again, taking care of those who are in need. And Jesus says, I was hungry and you didn't give me anything to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. And they say, when did we ever see you? What are they doing? They're shocked. He's lost, his family is lost. So here's the question, coming back around. Are you the rich man? Are you selfish? Are you selfish? The only thing that matters is me and and my family. People say, oh, you're you're saying this. No, I'm not. That's absolutely foolish. And if someone thinks that, I actually resent the implication of that. But if I have the disposition that the only people that matter are me and the people who live in my house or the people who have similar blood that flows through their veins, i got a problem. I am not the center of existence. My family is not the center of existence. What they want does not trump what everybody else may need. It is not about us. And the truth of the matter is, is that none of us are God's gift to humanity. Neither are our families God's gift to humanity. Because if that had been the rich man's brother, it would have been a different story. So are we selfish? That the only thing we care about is us getting what we deserve, what we're entitled to, our kids getting what they deserve, what they're entitled to, which, by the way, is setting them up for monumental disappointment in life. And all it's doing is perpetuating a cycle of teaching them to only think of themselves. Number two, am I disregarding God's law? Things that God has very clearly and very plainly revealed, and I'm looking at them going, "Mm, you know. Or, yeah, I mean, look, I know what that says, but I can't, you know, I can't help everybody. I don't think anyone is saying that any one person can help everybody. But what I have found with most people who make that argument, I can't help everybody, are the very people who help nobody. Do I busy myself with distractions, doing the things that I want to do and neglect and ignore what God wants me to do, what God wants me to be engaged in, where He wants me to be, how He wants me to be behaving? God is just disregarded. Listen, the rich man here, there is no, when you read this account again, there is no list of any, quote, major sin as people would think of it. There is no even inkling of the fact that he got his wealth in an ill-gotten way. 
But the sub-theme that runs throughout Luke's gospel is not that wealthy people are evil and they've gotten their money through evil ways. The sub-theme is, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Luke 12, 21. So while we look at the rich man, and we are rightly frustrated with what we see, if we looked at ourselves, we might see that we're more like the rich man than we ever care to admit. Because the third characteristic of the rich man was that he was lost. Look, I'm not, a, I'm not a scare tactic guy. I don't preach that way. But the truth of the matter is, listen, being lost is serious. And I can tell myself I'm okay all day long. And I can justify things to myself. The rich man had to find a way to justify his mistreatment to, to himself. There's no way he does it otherwise. But while I'm alive, I have the opportunity to do something about my lost state. When I am dead, I have no opportunity to do anything about it. This account makes that abundantly clear. There's nothing I can do at that point. But as long as I'm alive, I can. And so this morning, if we see ourselves in a lost state, we can come to Jesus with a penitent faith. Listen to what the Word of God says. With a penitent faith and confess Christ to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins. Or maybe as New Testament Christians, we haven't been living the way that we're supposed to. The rich man was a child of God. He was a Hebrew. He was a child of God by birth. Maybe that's who we are. Or maybe we're just struggling with things in general. As always, this isn't the only time we can pray about it together, but it is a time. And if we can help you now, we will as we stand and sing this song.